Good morning, beloved ones. Morning. It's a glorious day, a great and glorious day. Turn to somebody and tell them, I am great and grateful. I am great and grateful. Thank you, Papaya. I am great and grateful. Yes, I am great and grateful. So I wanted to ask this morning was, how are all of my light bearers doing? Well, great and grateful, wonderful. How are my light bearers, bearers doing? And I said, I'm praying that you are all doing well. My prayer is that you are feeling uplifted, that you are feeling empowered, that you are feeling enfolded in the presence and power of God, especially during these challenging times that we are in. Because I was thinking at any given moment in these days that we are experiencing, I find myself going between great highs and great lows, right? That I, you know, I, I feel myself just feeling a sense of great joy and then, oh my goodness, oh no. You know, up and down and having to, at that point, bring myself back into alignment, bring myself back into balance or back into the truth, the center of the truth that I know that grounds me and keeps me, you know, rooted and on the right path. So that even though life has me maybe swaying this way a little bit sometimes and swaying that way, I'm not uh, 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 lifted up off my foundation. I'm, I'm not just destroyed to the point where, where I'm blown away, that I'm able to move with life. And I experience the great highs and, and also those, those great lows. But that I also understand that there's something in me that is greater than anything in the world. And if I could get back to remembering that and touching that, using that as my touchstone, using that as my foundation, that I can weather these ups and these downs. Because I have been experiencing, I, I've been between bliss. I mean, the last, when I took my sabbatical and I spent those, you know, two weeks of just in pure meditation and in a high mountaintop and just, I was just blissed out and it was wonderful. But I vacillate now between the bliss and the stress. Right? Bliss and stress. But here's the good news. Because I'm noticing that I can no longer linger too long in the valley of despair. That I, it doesn't mean I don't experience it or it doesn't come my way, but it really is like a visit. I, I can't seem to linger in it as I used to do before in that valley of despair that I have to climb up and climb back and get into the mountaintop of hope. That, that there's a vibration that doesn't let me stay there. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. It doesn't mean that you never will experience the valleys in life. But you don't pitch your tent and camp out any longer. Right? Yeah. Because it's yea, though I what? Walk through the valley. <laughs> and so I'm learning not only to walk through, but my energy is like, oh, no, I can't stay here. And there are moments when I get up and it's sort of like, what has happened now? You know, this is some fires that are California being consumed and people losing homes and life and values and all, all, all of that. People making treks from, from, a, from different countries to try to find some sense of freedom or safety or, or, or something that will enable, enable them to live, you know, just a decent life. It's some, 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 some stuff going on out here that, that is causing us to really figure out how are we going to navigate this, this journey? How are we going to move through this thing called life? And what I've noticed is that my lows, my lows are no longer as low as they used to be because of my highs. 
My lows are different because my higher vibrations have taken me to a new level, a different level, so that even if I slip into a, a, a low state for a moment, I, I'm never able to really go to the degree where I used to be, to the level of low where I used to be. Oliver Wendell Holmes said this, he said that a mind that is stretched by a new experience can never go back to its old dimensions. Isn't that powerful? Because once you have a certain awareness, you can't become unaware of it. You may try to fool yourself and put your, hypnotize yourself and try to go back to sleep, but it's very, very difficult, right? So a mind that is stretched by a, a new experience can never go back to its old dimensions. And this is why we study truth. This is why we practice spiritual principles. This is why we try to have a new understanding and a new revelation because it's stretching us to expand our consciousness so that we don't go back to the old dimensions of being, to our old ways of living the old ways of experiencing. So we practice, we pray, and we try to have a new revelation and a new understanding and a new experience to stretch my consciousness, to expand my consciousness so that I am different. I'm at a higher level, that I keep ascending higher and higher or transcending deeper and deeper because that is helping me to what? To evolve and to grow and to change because I tell you, this is what we need to do so that our, what I call our energetic wattage gets increased. Because remember I tell you all the time that what is happening out here, that, that the, the energy that we are involved in that is present on earth at this particular time is very powerful and very strong. And I always used to give you the example of, of a 15-watt bulb and 150 watts of energy. And we know what happens when 150 watts of energy goes into a 15-watt bulb. Right? Kapoom, pow, boom, boom. And what we are seeing is that, you know, that there's a lot of energy moving into souls that are on a lower vibration and all of a sudden there's that mixing up and there's that explosion and there's that chemicalization and stuff is happening. People are losing their minds because they're not sure how to handle it. They don't know what to do with it. And so, and it can affect us as well. So what we are about as light bearers and true students and people on purpose and mission, what we're doing is we are making sure that we are increasing our spiritual waters, expanding our, stretching our consciousness, stretching our vibration so that we not only don't return to that lower vibration, but that we have a greater capacity to hold greater and greater good, greater and greater power, right? And that's a, that's, a, that's a powerful thing that we, that we are experiencing so that we are gaining in our evolution. We are becoming stronger in our essence. We have strength, as Dr. Martin Luther King used to say, we, and strength for the journey. And right now, this is what we need, y'all, some strength for the journey, right? Because we've got to be in this for the long haul. Tell them somebody say, I'm in this for the long haul. I'm in this for the long haul. Because every day, literally every day, there is something that can knock us off of center. Something that can cause us to, 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 to feel a sense of despair if we are not conscious and aware. So we've got this, this, this time period is not for the faint hearted. It is not for the faint of heart. We're going to have to be, uh, there's a scripture that says you got to put on the whole armor of God. We need the helmet, the breastplate, we need everything. you got to guard everything around with light because this is, this is what's being called for at this particular time in the journey. And so we, we can't lose heart. We can't you know, uh, lose faith. We can't move into hopelessness and helplessness and wondering what in the world is going on. Even though there's things that we want to, we want to do, we have to stick with this journey. One of the scriptures I love is from Galatians 6, 9. 
And this is what it says uh, in, in Galatians. Let me see if I can read that. It says, this is from the uh, King James Version. This one says, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So we can't be faint-hearted. And the message puts this scripture, Galatians 6, this way. It says, so let's not allow ourselves to get fatigued doing good. At the right time, we will harvest a good crop if we don't give up and quit. Right now, therefore, every time we get the chance, let us work for the benefit of all, starting with the people closest to us in the community of faith. I like the way the message puts that, right? So, and this is the way it says in the Amplified Classic Bible. They say it this way. And let us not lose heart and grow weary and faint in acting nobly and doing right. For in due time and at the appointed season, we shall reap if we do not loosen and relax our courage and faint. I like all of those. You know, that's powerful because these are the times that are calling for greater courage, are they not? Because we're all having to do things that we've never done before or to think in ways we've never thought before. And clearly, this is not the time to lose heart, which is why we gather together in community. Because if I'm down for a moment, I need all of you to pick me up in consciousness. And when you get down, let me hold you up in prayer. And if you have a need, let me come and speak and pray for you and you for me and each other. We are family. We are connected to each other. So we come to gather in community to also amplify our strength and amplify what we're doing so that we can go out there, right, and shine our light and do our work and hold down the fort. Because this is what we've been called to as, as, as true students and light bearers. So... This is really powerful because we are growing stronger. This is the time for all of us to actually go stronger, to grow stronger in our faith, to grow stronger in our commitment, to be brave of heart. You know, I was thinking of a brave heart. You know, we got to be brave of heart, to, to be uh, more, even, even to be strong hearted, but also tender hearted. And also compassion, a heart, having a heart of compassion, to be open hearted. Because a lot of what I think is happening in today is the result of humanity becoming closed-hearted. And when the heart is closed, it causes us to feel separate from others. When your heart is closed, you have built a, a wall around yourself. And you've walled yourself in, but you also have walled everybody else out. Right? And so when that happens, we begin to feel separate from each other. And once we begin to feel separate from each other, it becomes easier to devalue, to dehumanize, and to disenfranchise others. Because you're not like me. You are different than me. And so watch the language that's being put out, whether it's the news about other people and groups of people. You know, if they're, they're animals, they're criminals, they're this, anything that is going to separate them from being human beings who are probably seeking safety, well-being, the basic connections that enable us to to live, but if I could demonize a whole group of people and, and, and have you be afraid of them, then it becomes easier for me to encourage you to also annihilate them. You've got to be vigilant in what's happening and listen to the language and the words. I was on Facebook and I, I saw a heartbreaking, heartbreaking picture of some starving children in Yemen, and they were little ones. And I noticed myself that 
I couldn't even, I couldn't look at it long because they were babies and they were little one-year-old, two, like your, your grand, grandson, crying. They were so thin and they were crying and weeping. And I could not look at it long because it was hurting my heart. But what I wanted to do was like, oh, I couldn't look at it. So I what? I turned away. See, this is what, this is, this is the danger. Because what I did was it made me want to turn away because I didn't want to see the suffering and I didn't want to see the pain. But what that does is closes my heart off to the suffering and the pain. And it makes it easier for me to ignore that that's not happening to me or to my grandkids or my children or whatever. So therefore, I don't want to see it. It's very powerful. Listen, this is what, this is what I found. That, that the, uh, I participated in a... Uh, a peace project, and they were sending some energy, this gathering of Arab countries and the U.S., and we were sending uh, some peaceful thoughts and energy to Yemen. But this is the thing. The war in Yemen has been described as the worst humanitarian crises in the world, and yet I guarantee that not many of us know what's going on there. They say that there are 8 million people on the brink of complete famine, and that there are 22.2 million people in Yemen who have this great humanitarian need for simply water, food, and shelter. And that both sides of this civil war have engaged in, well, in criminal crimes and war crimes and activity, which means dehumanizing other human beings. That's what war crimes do. Right? It's, a, it's, an inflicted, it's an infliction of pain and suffering upon another human being. There's something afoot in the consciousness that is on the planet right now that enables someone to say, I'm going to kill you because you wrote something negative about me. But not only am I going to kill you, I'm going to torture you and dismember you. And there's something deep that's going on when humanity begins to close its heart off so that we can't acknowledge the humanity of another living soul. That we could allow, we've, we've been here before, where there were 22 million Jews that, that were exterminated before people said, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, this is not right. We've been down this road. And yet, how are we, we're, it's, it's, it's really, when we're in oblivion, we don't really know. We're content to be in our comfortable space. Yeah. But you better be awake because your comfortable space can change in the twinkling of an eye because there's a ground. <laughs> See, there's, there, there's a consciousness that's being seeded that lets us believe that it is okay to be inhumane to one another. And so we, who are the Ecclesiastes, the called out ones, we who are the awakened ones, we who are the light bearers, must begin to truly wake up and to do what is ours to do. So that when we see in our own country the degree of intolerance and hatred and how it is causing us to behave in ways of dishonor, and disconnection, where we think it's fine and separate. I'm going to uh, not allow you to vote because it'll help benefit me. There's a, a, a level where we have lost a certain sense of value, our values and the consciousness to do good and to be about the good. There's a shift that's coming apart and we're a part of it. I've always said that the next big revolution has to be a spiritual one because that's the only one that is going to save us from ourselves. There's a spiritual process which I believe has to occur right now for the times that we're living in, and the process is called the flowering of the heart. The flowering of the heart. And if you remember, a couple of weeks ago, I shared with you how the heart is not only the principal organ for life, that the heart is what gives life, right, and speaks to life, but that it's also, because when the, you know, the, we think it's the brain and the mind, but it's not that. When the, you can be brain dead, but when the heart goes, there is no more life in this manifestation in the body. 
and that somehow that this whole thing of focusing on the heart as the principal organ for the body to experience life, it is the heart that is also the principal organ spiritually to give us life, to bring us spiritual life. So unless the heart begins to flower, that is, unless the heart begins to open up spiritually, it will be quite difficult for us to feel a sense of compassion for the sacred other. We might have a lot of head knowledge, right? We might even have a certain level of consciousness, but that level of consciousness, if it's not rooted in the heart, is not going to yield much transformation. And so we talked about how this wonderful sense of connection to the heart is very vital for us to begin to feel compassion and to feel the love of God because it's, it, it's coming from the heart, the, the divine sense of love, the divine sacred sense of the heart within the heart of God, the heart of being. That's why the great invocation says, you know, let the hearts of minds be opened by the love of God. It's the love of God has to enter in to the heart. And then the consciousness begins to shift and change, which is why sometimes we think we're making a change. We say our affirmations, but your heart hasn't changed. Right? Your heart, you're still hard-hearted. Your heart is still closed. And you think your mind is so open. Right? What good is your mind being open if your heart is closed? You're not going to be able to manifest and sustain the good that you're really seeking to receive the blessings of God. And what's importantly, more importantly, to be able to actually experience this transformative power, this transformative tool that lies within the heart. And so we really want to wake up and open our hearts because, you see, when the heart flowers, what it does is it begins, once the heart opens up, then it expands your awareness and then it expands your consciousness. Your consciousness does not open your heart. Your heart opens your consciousness. And when your heart begins to flower, you begin to increase your capacity to give and receive from the goodness of God. When the heart flowers, you begin to expand your consciousness, and the heart then says, compassion resides here. Compassion becomes commonplace. The high expression of love as a divine entity becomes commonplace. You see, we've kind of lost the capacity to feel. You remember the uh, righteous brothers? You've lost that what? That loving feeling. We've lost the loving feeling of what it is that connects us. It's all about money. It's about, I just like, wow, where are we as a people? Just to think, you know, we know we've had uh, the experience um, a couple of Sundays ago of some people in the church experiencing some uh, ill effects of, of salmonella that was found in the poison. And do you know what? The CDC says that it knows some of the brands, but it's not going to publish the brand names. And I'm like, why would you not do that? And you know, we know why they would not do that. Why do you think they would not do that? Money, money. So we're going to tell you, but we're not going to tell you. What, and I'm like, have we gone down so low that we place money over everything? Over, every, over people's safety and lives, money over everything. And I'm like, wow, how can that be? So, so we have a work to do to bring compassion back into the world, to open up the, so that the heart begins to flower and we begin to make high choices, wise choices, choices that benefit the whole, choices that include all of life, you know, the choices that allow us to get back to that loving feeling because we've let the head hijack the heart. We've let the head hijack to our hearts to the degree that our feeling nature is diminished, that we can't even look. I can't even look at starving children. I have to turn away instead of saying, no, no, look at that, so that that moves me to do something. It moves me to, to have compassion. And so I'm, I'm, I'm asking myself, what is it that I can do? I don't want to turn my head away. I'm not sure what I can do, but there's something that can be done. This is what happens when we allow ourselves to place heart over head. And not to get stuck in our heads, but to bring the heart, because the heart gives us life. The heart brings everything to life. 
So we've got to stop getting stuck in the head and stop overthinking everything and begin to ask this question. When you stop overthinking things, I want you to begin to ask, what is the loving thing to do here? That's a powerful question. What is the loving thing to do here? So you're in a situation, whatever the experience may be, but if you stop and you say, what is the loving thing? See, because the head could get you out of a lot. You can rationalize your behavior. You could do a lot. But when you ask, what is the loving thing to do here? What that question does is it, connect, it connects you instantly to spirit. You have an instant connection to the divine when you ask, what is the loving thing to do here? And once you are connected to the spirit, it begins to stimulate your ability for compassion, your ability to feel, and your ability to access the higher wisdom. Remember a couple of weeks I said the wisdom that we're seeking is the wisdom of the heart, that the heart's wisdom is greater than the head's wisdom. And so when we ask that question, what's the loving thing to do here, it instantly moves you into that vibration of God, into the higher consciousness and presence of God that will enable you to transform the situation from the highest vantage point and for the highest good of what? All concerned. All concerned. You, what happens, you automatically, when you ask that question, you automatically begin to bring divine energy, divine wisdom, and divine power into your experience and into your expression, and you begin to change. Your situations and circumstances begin to change. And so as a light bearer, I want you to begin to ask this powerful question at every opportunity that you have. What is the loving thing to do here? And then I want you to have the courage to do it. See, we can ask, but you've got to have the courage to then do it, to follow your heart, to follow your highest heart, your divine heart. I'm not talking about the little sentimental heart, right? Because what we're doing is we're training our heads to live from a higher consciousness from the heart. We're training the head to be led by the heart. So we're not talking about this sentimental, being a sentimental sap, but I'm talking about being a transcendent transformer. When you live from the heart and you think from the heart and you choose and act from the heart, you become a transcendent transformer. Because love, which resides within the heart, divine love, transforms everything. Right? It's a healer. It's a harmonizer. You know, you can't be in the presence and in the company and the vibration of love and not be transformed, not be opened up. It doesn't work. You, you, something automatically changes within you, and it changes your life. And so we're talking about being the ones who can access the higher frequencies. 150 watts, not 15 watts. Maybe we'll be 1,500 watts. Why not? But accessing the higher frequencies of God and the highest frequency of God is love. That's the, that's the highest power of God, the transformative power, the vibration of God is love. So we've got to begin to use it as a spiritual tool. See, because what I'm talking about is not a concept. I'm telling you how to use it as a spiritual tool to be used to heal, bless, transform, change, lift up. To expand because what happens is when we begin to ask this question what's the loving thing to do here we are also then expanding the capacity of our hearts for the heart to grow for us to become big-hearted and the bigger your heart the greater your impact the bigger your heart the greater you will impact your world and those around you right and we are here to impact the world make no mistake about it if you've never known what your purpose was I'm telling you what it is right now it's to transform this world. We can see that, right? That's what we're stepping into. So we've got to expand our hearts. And one way to expand the heart is to become grateful and thankful for everything. A grateful heart is a heart full of greatness, right? A grateful heart is a heart full of greatness. Charles Fillmore said this in The Revealing Weird. He said, Thanksgiving is rendering our grateful hearts to God for his manifold blessings. 
Thanksgiving will keep the heart fresh, for true Thanksgiving may be likened to rain falling upon ready soil, refreshing it and increasing its productiveness. So thankfulness and, and gratefulness keeps your heart and your soul fresh. The soul is your consciousness, the sum total of, we say the soul is sum total of your consciousness, superconscious, conscious mind, subconscious mind, it's all your awareness, all your thoughts, feelings, attitude. And so when, what happens is when you are, are grateful and thankful, it becomes like it says, it, uh, water, rain that, re, that, that renews and refreshes ready soil. The soil is your mind, the soil, right? And that rain is making it ready to receive the goodness, to receive the seed, to receive the word, to receive the positive thoughts, feelings, and energies that then increase and grow. Because when you water a seed, that seed what grows? The goodness grows. Gratefulness, thankfulness increases. Whatever it is you are speaking into being, it increases it. And who doesn't want a little bit more increase? Increase of good, right? increase of God's presence. But it all starts with a willingness to open your heart and to allow it to flower and to take the lead. Because when the heart leads, when the heart is in charge, it will guide the head. Not that we don't need our heads, we need our heads. <laughs> but we need it to be guided by the heart. Right? And so when that happens, then we have higher, we will make higher choices and, and, and higher actions will follow. Higher thoughts, higher choices, higher actions all lead to a higher life, one that's transformed by the power of love and gratitude. Love and gratitude. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And so we're using these as tools, spiritual tools, to transform our world, to strengthen our hearts. And so I want that to be your practice. Practice what I call the quickening question. And what is the quickening question? The moment you ask that, spirit is quickened. You understand? The moment you ask that and you're willing to listen, <laughs> the spirit in you will be quickened. And the activity of spirit begins to stir up and you'll be guided to do what is yours to do. The highest thing. The highest good. It's very powerful. So hopefully you will begin to take on this wonderful direction of using this spiritual tools of gratitude and thankfulness and love and working with the heart and doing it on a consistent basis. Being grateful, rendering grateful hearts. Mr. Fillmore said when you render thanksgiving is rendering grateful thoughts to God for his manifold blessings. And I say for everything, not just some things, not from, just for the things that we like, for everything because there is some good in everything. God is in the midst of every trial, tribulation, every negative, God is present. And when you begin to say, let me look for the good in here, let me see where God is, all of a sudden you'll begin to open up and you will be transformed. There's a reason why the Bible says in everything, give praise and thanksgiving. Everything. It's a powerful activity to do. So I hope that you will uh, begin to transform your heart and your soul. I invite you to come on out uh, Wednesday for our Holy Communion service. This is the one time of the year that we symbolize and use the Holy Communion elements of the bread and the wine, grape juice, cranberry juice, but of wine, and we'll take communion together. We will take communion together because communion just simply is a, it's supposed to symbolize the one body, the body of Christ, which we are. So we will do that as we bless our world and our lives and we look for the power of praise. We'll look for the essence of love and gratitude as living, living entities and essence, an essence that will move us on this journey to strengthen our journey. So in the meantime, let's raise the vibrations of love and gratitude. Let's be open-hearted, big-hearted, tender-hearted, strong-hearted, brave-hearted, and God-hearted centered. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste.